Welcome to Module 10 of the Documentation of Contract Companies. We are in the Documentation Guide in Section B, and we're going to start to cover paid units, such as acres, hours, calendar day, and calendar to month. Here in Section B, on page B1 in the Doc Guide, it's all about the paid units. All right, we've talked about calculating quantities uh, and then converting those to the appropriate pay unit. How do you find out? what your pay item has for a pay unit. Well, if you don't have any other information and you have a pay item number and a pay item description, you can go to your pay item and look at what? Yep, the first three digits of your pay item number tell you what article in the spec book to go to. And then within that article, I would go to which section? Basis of payment. Basis of payment will tell us what pay unit our item should be in. Pay units are the bold headings at each of the top of these boxes, such as acres, calendar day, calendar month, and so forth. Underneath each of the pay units, you will see a reference to section F, where we have at least one example. Some of them have more than one example. The middle column provides the accuracy of measurement, or the minimum accuracy of our quantities and our measurements. Here we can see acres is to the nearest tenth of an acre, calendar days to the nearest hundredth of a calendar day. The far right column shows us what documentation is required to substantiate and document these quantities. Here most of them will be field measurements used to calculate the final quantity. There may be some conversions in this column. A lot of them will also be eligible for the BC 981, which is our agreement to plan quantity, which we covered in a previous module. Let's get started. We'll start with acres and move through these pay units and see how it goes. Acres. Pay items that we're looking at here, seeding, uh, also tree removal. We're going to show you an example <clears throat> for seeding. Like we said, accuracy of measurement in the middle column, 0.1 acres, and then our required documentation. Here we go. We are hydro seeding. All right, we're painting this slope green with seed, mulch, and nutrients all at the same time. Uh, you can notice that we're applying this up the slope as well as we have a baseline down here. So when we're taking our measurements, if we would go to article 250, which is seeding, we would see that all measurements should be taken along the slope. We're going to have to take several measurements where the slope changes and then plot out our shape and make our calculation on area. Let's take a look at page F43 in the doc guide. It is an IDR example of paid by the acre. Here we have our, our pay item number 2500200. That's where I get spec article 250 for seating class two. We got our location. Here's our evidence of material inspection. And down here we have our field measurements laid out by station where we took our readings. These, these vertical lines represent up the slope. The horizontal line at the bottom represents our baseline, and we basically have three trapezoidal shapes, and we're gonna break this up and calculate each one of those trapezoids. Here we have, here's the first trapezoid where we're averaging the parallel sides and multiply by the perpendicular distance between it. We do the same thing for the middle shape and the shape on the right. We add them all up, we get some total square feet. This is the important part. We just calculated a quantity in square feet, but what pay unit are we working in? We're working in acres, so I need to do my conversion. I'm converting my calculated units into my pay unit, and I come up with 4.5 acres. I do meet the minimum accuracy of a tenth of an acre at 4.5. Put that up here, quantity and units in my box on the IDR, looking pretty good. Next up is hour. We're gonna go through most of the time pay units at this point. Hours, the only one we talk about here are trainees, and there's a specific form, the SBE 1014. This is a federal program to get apprentices and journeymen in the craft trades, time and experience out on projects. Monthly entries in the quantity book are cross-referenced and summarized with our SBE 1014 forms. On page F62, we have an example of this weekly trainee report. Typically, your contractor's filling this out with the hours 
on the dates that the apprentices have worked. Uh, we're keeping a running total to date because that's the number we put in our pay estimates. Uh, we're checking off some statistics here, some metadata with ethnic group, FHWA or IDAP program, uh, the work classification and their status, whether they're apprentice, a trainee, journeyman, and so forth. Contractor's going to sign this form attesting to the hours and we're going to double check the math and then we can submit it on our pay estimates. Calendar day. Three items that we talk about here about calendar day. Traffic control surveillance. We have an example that we would go through for this one. Storage of large items. Uh, structural steel being one of them. Maybe elastomeric bearing assemblies. We also have on-site monitoring of regulated substances. Uh, this happens when we're working around areas of soil contamination. We're looking at the accuracy of measurements here, traffic control surveillance at 0 0.01 or a hundredth of a calendar day. Structural seal is a little different. Uh, when we're talking about storage, it is to the nearest whole calendar day. And on-site monitoring is a little bit different. It's a fraction of a calendar day, but it's either half a calendar day or a whole calendar day. So for up to four hours, we have half calendar day. Anything over four or equal to, we give them one calendar day. Just note, we cannot exceed one calendar day in a given 24 hour period or in one date. Here we see some pictures of the chain of rocks steel plate girders. We saw some of this before when we talked about material allowance in a previous module. Okay, these were fabricated and the fabricator doesn't have room to store these huge beams, so they send them out here uh, to a storage yard. It is a protected storage area. Way in the back, you can see we have a fence, even have our spiral uh, barbed wire on it. We've got them up on cribbing, right? We've got some cross beams and some wood to allow for expansion, thermal expansion and contraction. Here we have another picture of how these beams are staged and stored. Pretty large beams. Another example was the Cumberland County Covered Bridge. Here's our covered bridge, kind of a non-typical uh, IDOT structure. There's a nice shot leading up to it. And here's the interior where this is the portion that we stored. We had these wood, uh, manufactured wood truss systems that were constructed in Wisconsin and stored over winter until it was time to erect them. So here we have calendar day for the on-site monitoring of regulated substance. Here we can see our environmental professional is out here with their uh, volatile organic vapor uh, detection equipment or PID. An example, day one contractor works from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. or 700 to 1600. Second shift they work from 1800 to, to 20. Uh, day two they started at 7 and they were completed at 10 a.m. How many calendar days does the contractor get paid? Once again, we have either a whole calendar day or a half a calendar day. Here we go. Shift 1, they get one calendar day. They were still in the same day with the second shift, so there's no additional payment. They already got their whole calendar day. The second day, they only work three hours, so they get a half a day. So the total for this event would be 1.5 calendar days. Let's take a look at traffic control surveillance. We are in the spec book, page 604, and we're in article 70110, surveillance. So when do we need surveillance? If you were to read this paragraph, you can see basically if we have a hole large enough for a motorcycle tire to fit in it, three inches deep and four inches wide, or other hazards are present within eight feet of the edge of an open lane, the contractor shall furnish traffic control surveillance. Here is the important part. During all hours when the contractor is not engaged in construction operations. So, one, we have to have a hazard as defined here in the spec within eight feet of an open lane of traffic. The contractor's gonna perform this surveillance and they're gonna perform that surveillance during the time, all hours, when they're not engaged in their normal construction operation. 
So if they're working days, their surveillance will be at night and vice versa. If they're working nights, surveillance will be during the days. All right, when the contractor's on site performing their normal operations, they're getting paid under the traffic control and protection lump sum for maintaining traffic control. So this is above and beyond. It further states, the contractor must inspect the entire job site at such intervals as may be required not to exceed four hours. So what does that mean to us? At least every four hours, the contractor's personnel must drive the entire job site and inspect and maintain the traffic control devices. Okay, they're gonna fill this out on a form, which should be given to the engineer on the first working day after the inspection. Here on page F44 in the doc guide, we have the traffic control surveillance report or the BC2240. And the contractor has indicated the period where they work. They're working between eight and 4.30. So that's their normal shift. So outside of that is when we need surveillance. So from 4.30 p.m., here we go, up until midnight, and then again, up until the time they come back to work the next time. Uh, we're gonna count all those hours up, and that's gonna be what we're gonna pay for surveillance, as long as they come out at least every four hours. So they left at 4.30, they came back at six. Yep, that's within four. They come back four hours later at 10 p.m. Everything looks good. Whoop, they moved the barricade back in place. That's awesome. They came back at 2 a.m four hours later, and again at 6 a.m. They returned the next day on their shift at 8 a.m. So we're all done with surveillance. You can do your calculations right on this form. For the payment, we're gonna take the number of hours that they performed the surveillance, in this case from 4.30 p.m. until 8 a.m. the next day, which is 15 and a half hours. I have to convert that to a calendar day, so I divide by 24 hours in a calendar day, and that gives me a total pay of 0 0.65 calendar days for this event. Uh, you will note that from 8 a.m. until midnight was on September 14th. The top portion of the form was actually on September 15th. This is one of the cases on this form where a contractor is allowed to wrap around the form to the next calendar day uh, just to make sure we capture all this event on one form. Here are some photos of some traffic control that we might need surveillance for. Here we've got missing pavement. We're reconstructing, and these vehicles are definitely within eight feet of that open lane. Same thing down here. Here I've got the gap between the old pavement and the new reconstruction. Definitely is a hazard within eight feet of an open lane. Anything on these pictures that doesn't look right to you? How about this Type 3 barricade? Here we have the nice hashes. They're directing our traffic where? Right into our job site. These hashes should be pointing away. The eye is gonna follow down the direction of the hash. We want our eyes to follow into the open lane, not into our construction. This one's not so awesome because our traffic control devices are actually sitting right on the hazard. These barrels should at least be on this side of the hazard. Once they hit a barrel, it's all over. Their tire is stuck between the the two different pavement structures, right? Okay, let's look at workbook page six. We have a problem for you to work, uh, to read through. The contractor worked from 7 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. each workday. The contractor performed the required inspections for the time period stated up here. So go ahead and look at this problem. You may wanna pause the video. Let's work it and we'll come back with an answer in a moment. All right, workbook page 28 has this answer to the traffic control surveillance problem. Let's take a look. So from Tuesday, 4.30 p.m., they quit their normal shift until they came back at 7 a.m. on Wednesday the next day. That total period is 14.5 hours, All right? The next day, they worked their normal shift from 7 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. on Wednesday. So from 4.30 p.m. when they leave, until they come back on Thursday morning at 7 a.m. is another 14 and a half hours. Sometime during the day Thursday before they left, they fixed the hazard. We didn't need surveillance anymore. So now we can do our math. 14 and a half plus 14 and a half equals 29 total hours. All right? Am I done? Nope. 
I got to convert to my pay unit. What is my pay unit? Calendar days. So I take my total hours worked, divide by 24 hours per day, and that will give me 1.21 calendar days for traffic control surveillance for this entire event. Did anybody get a different number? Maybe 1.20. It is possible. This would represent one form. If you took 14 and a half hours divided by 24 to convert, you would get 0 0.604 calendar days. Rounding up to our accuracy, it would be 0 0.60 calendar days. If I have two of those, 0 0.6 plus 0 0.6, this could be 1.20. Either way is acceptable. Auditors will accept either method. Our recommendation, just do it the same way each time. Calendar month. Really only one item we talk about on the calendar month is the engineer field office. You can pay to the monthly or fraction thereof. So you can prorate any portion of a month that you might have. Say you accept the field office 10 days into a month. You can prorate by the number of days left in the month until the next pay estimate, and then you can pay that fraction. Summation of final quantity can be to the nearest half a month, but it doesn't have to be. Remember, these are minimum accuracies. You will want to note in your project diary on the date from which you accept the engineer's field office. After that, you can make direct entry into the quantity book. You don't need another source document uh, to make these monthly entries in the quantity book for the engineer field office. You can refer to Article 670 for field office requirements, and I hope you get a luxurious field office such as this. Okay, maybe that's a little bit of a joke. In the days gone by, we used to have mobile job trailers would be our field offices. Uh, depending on what district you're in, you may still have a mobile field office, but a lot of times these days, contractors are renting maybe an office unit somewhere for you and providing what you need. The most important thing is to look in Article 670 and in your plans and special provisions for any agreements that have been made for what is required in the field office. What the contractor has, has agreed to provide, make sure you're getting that before you actually accept it and pay for it. 